Okay, the second claim was lectins cause leaky gut. Matt, have you seen any any evidence for this? Um, so one of the one of the things that has come up um, is this idea that certain lectins or lectin containing foods um, can contain even non lectin compounds. But we'll say lectins for sake of argument um, can bind to uh, what are called toll like receptors, and these can uh, trigger inflammation in the gut, uh, perhaps lead to intestinal permeability, and this is usually demonstrated in, say, animal models where they'll actually place the the compounds right into the intestine or the intestinal wall and see what happens, um, or perhaps in a Petri dish with certain epithelial cells that would typically line the gut. Uh, and you see, yeah, there may be some adverse effects in that context, but that's not what we're looking at. We want to look at, in the context of a functioning human body, what actually happens. And we don't actually see that. There might be certain markers of intestinal permeability that rise when you give gluten to people with, say, celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but we already know they have problems with gluten, right? That doesn't pertain to the 95-ish, roughly, percent of people who don't have issues with gluten um, or other lectins, perhaps. And so I'm, uh, I think that's where it largely stems from, but the irony there is that there are bacterial endotoxins in meat, for example, um, that can also bind to those same toll-like receptors and lead to intestinal permeability in the similar sort of context, those preclinical studies and whatnot. Why is it that we're pointing the finger at these uh, lectins when you could easily point the fingers at the foods that they are recommending? At the end of the day, what we have to do is step back, look at the human health outcome data and seeing does this lead to worse outcomes in humans when they're consuming it? Um, and in that case, we just don't see that. Yeah, th there's there's a, a really good point there, which is that why do we single out, you know, for example, one of the mechanisms with, with lectins is this increase in lipopolysaccharides. But you can see that with dietary saturated fat intake, and you won't hear anyone, <laughs> certainly on the, you know, carnivore side of the fence, discuss the increase in endotoxins and endotoxemia that are observed with high saturated fat. And this is not mechanistic. This has been demonstrated in some, for example, of Hanley Iki Arvinen's uh, fatty liver research on, you know, high saturated fat intake. You could see increases in, in, uh, in endotoxin associated with the kind of, you know, uh, well, that they were overfeeding by like a thousand calories a day of saturated fat. But again, this was demonstrated in, in a human context. Whereas, like Matt said, you know, animal models, yes, high doses, but and a really important point Matt said, animal models and cell culture studies are often using the isolated compound itself, and from a from a from a scientific and 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 kind of methodological standpoint, this is crucial because this is not necessarily at all analogous to cooking and preparing red kidney beans and feeding them to humans. So they're very different concept, you know, conceptual approaches that, that, you know, obviously someone like a Stephen Gundry is unconcerned with because he's only concerned with framing the specifics of his claim. But in terms of assessing research that's available, that's a really important factor. And ultimately it doesn't appear, at least I haven't seen any human data that would suggest Obviously, Matt highlighted someone with individuals with celiac, but outside of that, I haven't seen any human trials using, for example, cooked beans that would show any sort of corroboration to some of the in vitro or animal model studies on effects of isolated lectins on intestinal epithelial function or, or uh, inflammatory markers. Right, so what you're saying there is that lectins could behave differently or affect physiology differently in an isolated form versus within a food matrix and consumed as, as a whole food. Well, and that that isolated form is not independent of dose. Um, you know, the doses used of an isolated form mechanistically uh, in in vitro research or in an animal model are often relative to you know a human organism um physiologically a lot higher than 
what would be achieved from a normal diet. I think this is an important point. So re- remind people, how should we think about animal studies? So let's think bigger picture here, not even just this lectin conversation. They're on social media and they, they see an in vitro um, or an, an animal study being shared and being used as evidence to support some type of dietary change, food behavior. What do you want people to, to kind of pause and, and think about? That the, the proper place of it is, and it is important, uh, in vitro research is important, cell culture research is important, animal models are important. They're important to investigate uh, potential pathways, potential mechanisms, potential dose responses if food additives are being introduced into the food supply. So that's a particularly important concept when it comes to artificial sweeteners. And people will make claims about neurotoxicity, but they're deliberately pushing doses up to try and identify what will ultimately be known as the no adverse um, no observed adverse effect level. So these models of research are important, but they are experimental research, okay? And there's a term that's often used, like translational science, right? Ultimately, if it's going to have validity for, for humans and human outcomes, there needs to be translation from those preclinical models or cell culture studies across into humans, so those models often serve as a starting point, um, but they need to then be translated into uh, into in vivo effects, i.e. in living humans. And you quite often, depending on what we're talking about, do not see that translational adverse effects that you might see uh, and so in their proper place, they do provide important context and information. So Simon, you shared a study that you said Stephen Gundry apparently relies on, on lectin activity, a study I think was published in 1989. Um, and you look at a study like that, for example, which was conducted in rats and looked at their growth trends, fed diets that were containing raw kidney beans or kidney beans cooked at various temperatures and so in that study, for example, whether kidney beans in terms of the gram amount per kilogram of body weight, and remember rats are fairly small organisms compared to humans, 100 to 150 to 200 grams of raw kidney beans per kilogram of, of the rat's body weight when cooked at 100 degrees, you know, when boiled, completely eradicated any presence of, uh, or any evidence of growth inhibition that was observed and so, so so someone can look at that study and see growth inhibition from raw and uh, kidney beans in that in that study and go running off with it saying look this is an example of an adverse effect of but again it's not even a representation of the study itself and so what would be more relevant as a data point from this study to take into available human evidence would actually be the evidence in relation to the effects of cooking and indeed, if we if we do look at, uh, you know, um, the, the 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 impacts of properly proper preparation, that would be consistent with why we would assume that there wouldn't be these constant negative effects uh, in humans because those preparation methods are typically used. Hey, friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide plant-based ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. Would it be fair to say that for a food group like legumes or whole grains, when we're talking about preparation, um, we're talking about soaking and cooking, and if done using, I guess, the typical methods for that, that the majority, if not all, lectins are removed, or at least the lectins that could be problematic? Yeah, I mean, if you're cooking to the point that they're soft and edible, so 
Um, I mean, you can squish it with a fork. That's usually the little test that I, I suggest, right? If you can squish it with a fork, chances are the lectins are down into single digit percentages, if not eradicated altogether uh, or undetectable. And in that case, yeah, it's safe to eat. Canned legumes are already cooked and safe to eat. Um, so it, I mean, yes, there are cases where, where there have been lectin poisoning from undercooked or say dry roasted kidney beans or something like that, where they're not prepared in, in a proper way. Um, those cases are very rare typically, and they'll be concentrated in, you know, a specific kitchen was preparing them in the incorrect way. And, and during a day of, of eating a bunch of people got sick or, or what have you. But, um, but fortunately this isn't common and, and yeah, there might need to be a little more education around that for certain people or certain groups of people, but, but really it's not that challenging. And, and, you know, if, if you go, uh, I always point to my, my Indian background, you go to India, um, everyone's preparing these properly. We don't hear about, uh, like poisoning cases over there. It just, just to say that, 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 that is important because it could be a, a source of where people again, use to build this negative case. You, you can find, and this is not controversial or even disputed evidence of, uh, suspected, uh, cases of, um, poisoning or or food poisoning or toxicity and hospital admissions related to consumption of raw uh, or improperly uh, cooked uh, seeds or legumes. And there was one study I saw which was in the UK covering a 13-year period from 1976. And in that time frame, there were 50 incidents. Okay, so as Matt said, it's not particularly common and it is very much related to either uh, consumption of uh, the kind of raw, uncooked legumes or unripe seeds. Um, and again, th that's, this, this is almost negated for most people consuming these foods now because they'll likely be buying uh, preformed um, or pre-cooked canned versions. Um, but 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 those those cases are explainable and you know they're in many respects the exception that proves the rule. You yeah, know, I was just gonna say just to point out sort of another double standard like we we did with the whole you know saturated fat uh, and uh, and leaky gut you know so to speak issue is if you look at undercooked meat, you know what are the risks of that right? It, this this idea of of a food being harmful because certain cases of poisoning have occurred when improperly prepared, if you look at just um, salmonella from chicken alone in the U.S., it's estimated at about 100 deaths a year. Just salmonella from chicken, forget about E. coli from you know, beef or anything else, uh, for hospitalizations, hundreds of thousands. Um, or sorry, tens of thousands. And for, for illnesses, hundreds of thousands. So, And that's in a single year versus over a 13-year period in the U.K. So it's just, again why point the finger here rather than just educate people like, Hey, make sure that your beans are soft when you eat them. Um, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. And, and uh, you know, you don't have to turn a blind eye to the other issues. Just to reemphasize some of those points Alan made about animal studies, which I think is a really important learning is <clears throat> the importance of, of dose in those studies. Um, you know, often is not representative of the exposure that would occur in a in a human with a typical diet now the importance of the way in which that compound is delivered is it in a whole food is it isolated has it been prepared properly all of these things are going to influence how likely those results are to play out in in humans now, not to mention that often those those preclinical studies are looking at a single mechanism you know, and when we kind of zoom out and look at the health outcomes, we get a bit more of an idea as to the kind of net effect of that exposure across many mechanisms. Um, the other thing I would add to that that I thought was interesting is that when when these petri dish studies or animal studies are kind of used to create fear, generate fear around lectins, and I think you could almost find a... <laughs> a petri dish study or an animal study to generate fear over every single compound or the, or the main compounds in our diets just about but what you won't hear with regards to these types of studies um, and lectins is some of the potential beneficial properties 
that lectins may have. And I have a quote here from a, a study that says, in contrast to the anti-nutritional characteristics of lectins initially proposed by many researchers, some evidence suggests that lectins may have therapeutic benefits and could be used as functional foods and nutraceutical agents. Because of lectins' strong affinity and specificity to glycans, interest lies in their potential as both cancer diagnostic and treatment tools. Now, I'm not suggesting that this means that lectins are the next treatment for cancer, but you can see how the same argument could be created if we were to go and cherry pick this evidence. I mean, all you have to do is ask someone to search lectins in PubMed and you'll see, and they're all, they're all reviews. Don't, this is not you know human outcome evidence for the most part. It's reviews based on animal models and cell culture studies. But there's interest in lectins, and this goes to the point Matt made at the very start in terms of defining them. There's been interest in lectins in terms of uh, immune modulating effects in a positive sense. There's a couple of reviews in relation to the potential benefit for COVID night for SARS-CoV-2 specifically. There's interest in anti-carcinogenic, other uh, immune modulated conditions, HIV, for example. So I think that point is obviously, it's spot on. You can use, you know, you could easily be writing, you know, the lectin code or the lectin solution. <laughs> <laughs> New York Times best right there. Be, it has to be code or solution if it's, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and And you could be writing a book about how these compounds are going to, you know, prevent HIV and cure cancer and, cure, you know, ward off COVID. And this is, it's great. You might have just given someone an idea. Yeah. And, and yeah, someone's <laughs> going to do that. And then Alan's going to be responsible for the next like wave of nutrition pseudoscience. <laughs>